Okay, Brad. Today's the day. Oh, it's it's the Super Bowl of Black Friday sales. Black Friday. <laughs> Black Friday is the Super Bowl of Black Friday. Isn't that a little tautological? Look, it's just best not to think. Of, look, in a world where everything's on sale all the time and it's like I started getting Black Friday emails in it's like mid-September this year, it seems mm-hmm. like. No. Yeah. Um, partly I think it's because we do this podcast, but also partly because everything's like what, Prime Day. It's, it's sometimes is it in the summer. Is it like September? I don't know, man. I get emails about Prime Day all the time. I turned off emails from Amazon. I get so many emails about Prime Day. I don't need to know. Nope. I feel like uh, we did. We, we talked about deals on the full nerd this week, like PC building deals and went down category by category. And it, it's, it's like a little rough. Like you don't don't buy a video card right now unless you really need a video card. Right. Really? Why is that? Rumor is that Intel is about to launch Battle Mage, the, the new thing, you know, their new second gen GPU, which is quite good because it's basically the gpu from lunar lake it's anyway we don't need to get into it it's nice um presumably there's big nvidia and amd keynotes at ces in Mm -hmm. like a month and five days yeah leaks leaks are pointing to the 50 series nvidia cards being announced at ces yeah and and also amd has stated that their their basic their basic they're, they're, they don't care about high end they're just going after like video cards normal people buy this generation Mm -hmm. that seems smart I mean, maybe it hasn't. They've tried it before and it didn't work out great when they did it before. But I don't know. We'll see. Point is, don't buy a video card right now unless you like you, your 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 current one broke or something. The one place where there were some crazy good deals is on AM4. If you have an old AMD motherboard, you know, AM4, the socket that refuses to die. Uh-huh. <laughs> you can get you could get like a like a. um uh, a Ryzen 57 X3D, 5700 X3D, which is an eight core V cache, like still one of the top five CPUs for video games for like $179. Wow. Wow. You might have had to buy a bundle to get that, but like uh-huh. it's crazy. The deals are they're like they're flat. Micro Center had them real cheap. Everybody, they're, they're really, really inexpensive. That's, you know, look, sometimes that long lived CPU socket pays dividends. Yeah, it's 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 the thing. It's the thing that strikes me about the the like AMD is coming out with AM5 and saying, hey, this is going to last for a long time gives you a big advantage because you can buy a cheap CPU now and plan to upgrade it in a few years when they're less expensive. And it's like it's kind of compelling. Yeah. Now, going back to the shopping craze. Yeah. Where do you fall on the Black Friday versus Cyber Monday splits? Because there's like three things I'm on the hunt for. And there are some deals out there now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, because it's it is Black Friday at the time of this recording. Should I pull the trigger today or should I wait until Monday and see if anything gets better, knowing that there's a risk that the current deals could be gone by then? Well, OK, so I've been in a real life relationship with a human for pretty much the entirety of the Internet's existence. So I've never cybered before. Uh huh. Um, ASL. I uh, I don't know, man. I don't. I it's funny that stuff that I buy. For deals, like I bought a, a set of shelves, like guitar hanger slash shelves, so that I have a better way to store my guitar than putting it in the bag every time I'm done playing with it and hanging it up in the closet. Um, I don't, I don't buy a whole lot of specific stuff. On I, I buy gifts for people, I guess is the main thing. So I, I kind of just keep an eye peeled and then pull the trigger when I go. And um. Uh, Elena at, at, at PC World p- pointed out that because we're in that holiday return window time, your return windows on a lot of on a lot of retailers right now are until like mid January or end of January. Sure. So you can buy the thing on Friday today. And if you get a better deal, just cancel it and return it, especially if it's from someplace that doesn't charge for returns for unopened returns. Um, And then and then you can get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Now, if you're buying services, that's a little bit different thing. Yeah. Right. You probably can't just cancel those and get the money back. I mean, generally speaking, their terms in the service terms of services specifically say, hey, you can't cancel this and get we're not giving your money back. You can right. close out the remainder of your term, but we're no refunds. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I, uh, I, 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 my other thing is that as soon as I buy the thing, I kind of and I know I'm leaving money on the table by doing this. I try to stop obsessing over it. Yeah, that's probably the right way to go. Like when we got the car, I stopped looking at car deals Mm because it was just going to make me crazy and sad about the amount of money I spent that I could have saved. Oh, you mean like back when I bought that, uh, that mini led TV, which like I don't hate that there's a couple things about it. I wish were better, but I bought it because it was very reasonably priced compared to an OLED. Yeah. 
And then like two months later, the OLED I would have preferred to get was the same price. Well, Brad, let me tell you about the OLED sales on Black Friday. Oh, boy. They cheap. Yeah. Real cheap. Mm. I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at the Panasonic thinking maybe it's time, but wait, it's also not time. Wait, is that Panasonic OLED cheap? No, no, no. My old Panasonic. Oh, oh, oh. You're, you mean your Panasonic Plasma? Yeah, my good TV. Yes. Yeah, it's time. But also we're going to go, we're going to Vancouver in a week, so I'm not spending any money right now. Yeah, that's fair. Well, look, for every TV, there is a season. Turn, turn, turn. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we're going to we're going to Vancouver to the last Taylor Swift era show. Have I talked about this oh, on the show before? No, no, you have not. And I was wondering, I was like, oh, do they have friends in Vancouver? What's going on? The Couve. Yeah. So when when Taylor Swift came through San Francisco, we didn't. You know, Gina has been on the lottery for Taylor Swift tickets because my daughter likes Taylor Swift and my wife likes Taylor Swift. Since the and and as a result, I also by the by the transitive pro, pro, uh, uh, tra- transitive. Effect. Yes, I believe I believe that would be the transitive property. Yeah, transitive property. I also like Taylor Swift, it turns okay. out. Yeah. Um, so she she got in the lottery, the fan lottery, to buy tickets, not from scalpers, every like for, for LA and San Francisco and Portland and Seattle. And just out of habit as the last stop on the this worldwide year and a half long tour is in Vancouver, which isn't mm-hmm. that that far for us. She got tickets. Okay. All right. And paid face value for face face value Canadian for tickets to Taylor Swift. Now we, that meant we had to, we have to go to Vancouver to see Taylor Swift. Well, now to be clear, like, like a flight to Vancouver is basically a flight to Seattle, right? Plus like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. 30, but 30 minutes, but the flights, there's a lot more flights into Seattle and a lot fewer flights into Vancouver. Oh, so we're ended. We're flying into Seattle and then renting a car and driving across. Oh. Oh, how far is that drive? Like two an hour and a half. Well, it's not that's far. not so bad. But mainly because the hotels in Seattle and Vancouver, because there's not that much hotel capacity in Vancouver, are like fifteen hundred dollars a night. <laughs> oh, yeah. They Vancouver went into full on gouging mode. Oh, oh, you mean you're staying in Seattle and just driving to the show? So we're staying. We're staying in Vancouver for the night of the show, and and like outside Vancouver the night before. Boy. That's yeah, it's a process. Elaborate. Now, are you are you going to the show yourself or are you just a chaperone? No. See, this was a we had this conversation because we could have sold my ticket for a fairly substantial amount of money. Mm-hmm. And I I am going to the show. I have a okay. costume and everything. Wow. We, we have outfits. You have to wow. get an outfit. It's a, this, we're going to the last of the last show of the tour. It's huh. a big deal. So you are you are a not so secret Swifty, it turns out. I mean, look, my my out. Do you want to know what my outfit is? Sure. Well, you know, she has that song and she talks about star-crossed lovers, but it sounds like she says Starbucks lover. So I got an apron that has the pattern from her album Lover on the cover with the heart, the sparkly heart. Mm-hmm. And I got a Starbucks, uh, Starbucks, like barista apron uh, patch. It's good material. Putting the patch on the on the apron. So look, you're in tune with the youth. Yeah, I understand. I understand what the kids crave. Oh, uh-huh. Um, so anyway, yeah. So, uh, also on an unrelated note, we have to record the podcast for next week early this week oh. when I think about it, cause I'm going to oh. be gone next weekend. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I didn't, I, I should have probably communicated that earlier, but anyway, right. well, you know, okay. Uh, now, now we've covered that business. Do, yeah. do you know, do you know what listeners of this podcast crave answers? Uh huh. That's right. Uh, I mean, I look, I want answers too. I love once, answers once a month, whether they like it or not. Yeah. You get the answers. Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a Q and a episode. If you have a question for the podcast, you can send it to tech pod at content dot down. Or if you're a patron of this listener supported show, you can go to uh, the discord, which you have access to as a patron of this listener supported show uh, and uh, go to the question seeking answers channel. If you don't have access to the discord, you can go to patreon.com slash tech pod where for five bucks a month, you can support the show and gain access to the Discord, which is a delightful place full of beautiful people. That's right. And listen to the patron episode we just recorded about 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Where we talked about uh, projects and things, things that aren't probably full episodes, but are <laughs> of general interest. I talked about audio bookshelf. You talked about 
your cable talk, store, yes, sorting talk, method. Talk, we talked about the, the great cable purge that is now underway around here. Look, we all have a cable problem. That's the first step is admitting it. Do I need 30 or 40 HDMI cables? Probably nope. not. But what if? Given that some of them probably don't even run 1080p 60, you should just throw them all out. What let, if? let God sort it out. What if I had 40 devices that use micro USB that I wanted to use all at one time? You're fine. Just plug them in sequentially. You'll be okay. Yep. You only have yep. one set of hands. Yeah. Most of these uh, cables are going to be clear. Just like true. most of these questions are about to get answered. Yeah. We got it. It was a, it was a fine crop this month, yeah. just for yeah, the record. Quite a, quite a appropriate for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Good work, was, everyone. Which was yesterday at the time of this recording, a cornucopia of questions here. It's true. Shall we dive in? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. Well, now that you've, okay, now we, we have permission. We have go on question. Uh, we sent the email address. We plugged the Patreon. We said you can po- post in the question seeking answers channel. All of that. Everything that I'm supposed to do is done. It's all you from here on out. All inquisitive systems are go. Let's yep. get in here. Uh, I'll start with the emails as we often do here from Sean. Uh, any new board game recommendations as we enter holiday shopping season? So. This year for us, we haven't done a lot of new board games because we bought a like 13 or 14 game legacy game for Christmas last year. Got a, got that for Christmas last year. We got Ticket to Ride Legacy, which is a modernization, pretty dramatic improvement of the base Ticket to Ride. Like Ticket to Ride is is firmly for, for me Ticket to Ride is one of those games that's firmly in the fine category, right? Like it's like it's it's workman like you can play it. You make your trains, you build your network. It, it doesn't have like hard swings. It's not super dramatic. It's not like an opportunity to do something goofy with your friends. You just sit down and you and, and some time goes away. The legacy version of that game starts with the birth of railroads on the East Coast, just like running up and down the East Coast of the United States. And then you add regions as you go on and you, like the players get to choose the regions. And it's it's quite fun. It, uh, we played um, we're like, I think, game 10 of our campaign. And uh, so for folks who don't know, legacy games Legacy games are games where you we've talked about them before in the show, but it's like you you basically the game evolves as you play it. So like there's a the, the first one was Risk Legacy. And as a as it's designed to be played for like 12 to 14 sessions. And as you play and have wars and things happen, like things like you can nuke Australia and then Australia is just off of the risk board at that point. Boy, right? that'll give the Australia thread on the discord something to talk about. Yep. Yep. Um, but, but so ticket to ride, ticket to ride doesn't have nukes as far as we've gotten to yet, but you like, there are like, there's a, there's like mechanics around things like finding lost treasures and, and the, in the, you know, in the old West and, um, you know, building circuses out of Florida and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's quite good. It's been good, uh, with the kiddo. We, the three of us have been playing it and it's the first time she's kind of engaged with a game that's like this, where you get to put stickers on the board and change stuff up and, do all sorts of sorts of crazy stuff and give yourself powers and stuff like that. So it's quite good. That's cool. Um, we also played a fair amount of wavelength this year with just three of us. It's not really a game we play to win, but just to, to kind of, uh, this is a little bit older. It's a, um, it's a party game about being, uh, psychic. The idea is you have this dial that has hidden numbers on it and you have a category that's like things that are good and things that are evil. And then you spin the dial, randomly pick the position where the marker is, and one person has to pick a clue that tells people where on this all the way left or all the way right that clue would be. So like um, if like if one is savory and sweet and in the middle you have white bread, like that would be to me like a straight up answer on wavelength. It's quite good. That's cool. It's very good with a group of people. It ends up having interesting conversations because like last night we had one that was hot and cold and it was all the way almost to the hot side, but not all the way to the hot side. And I was like the surface of the sun. And, you know, you and I know Mm -hmm. that that there are things hotter than the surface of the sun. Oh, yeah. Like the core of the sun. Yeah. Or things in our laboratories in the in the in the on Earth, even or like I believe when the pistol shrimp fires, it is briefly hotter than the. Like, no. mic, like a micro dude look it up really the, the the surface of the sun is not that hot i mean it's hot but it's like not actually like as hot as you think you see this is the kind of conversation you get to have with hang, on, it's hang great. on pistol shrimp surface of sun the energy physics of the pistol shrimp oh boy this is a this is a this is course material at stanford actually oh 
Okay, uh, so don't need to go to Snopes to check this oh, one. Oh, out. Here it is. Look, actually, I'm on. This is literally from a physicist on Reddit. The temperature of the surface of the sun, 400 or sorry, 4,000 to 8,000 Kelvin, is not very hot. Uh, it's similar to the temperature of the Earth's core, for instance. Says this. There you go. Anyway, this is an answer nobody asked for. <laughs> 4,000 Kelvin, huh? Yes. Anyway. Okay. So anyway, my my placement of that was a little bit low. Then I should have I should have been higher. I should have been the core of the sun. Right. Case in point, wavelength leads to interesting conversation. Yeah. Um, the last one uh, is Blueprints of Mad King Ludwig. This was a Kickstarter that I backed years ago and just came out this year. It's um, it's a variant of Castles of Mad King Ludwig is a classic game. You have to build this uh, crazy castle based on requirements given you by a, the Mad King Ludwig. It, it comes with cool pieces and you have to place them all on the board and there's, there's scoring. It's like a work placement kind of game. Uh, the blueprints one, you draw the rooms that you want on a piece of vellum and you end up drawing a different castle each time. It is, it is a fabulous, fabulous game. I don't know how hard it is to get uh, post Kickstarter, but if it, if it comes up again, I would definitely, if you like that kind of game, I would definitely grab it. Um, the only knock against it is that you do have to use a yellow colored pencil. And as a result, it's sometimes kind of hard to see if your room is like, we have a, we have warm warm filament bulbs in our dining room and the yellow pencil is basically invisible in that context we have to play it during the daytime uh, and then the, the 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 one thing i will really recommend is for christmas last year i got a table mat that's a neoprene it's like a it's like an eighth of an inch thick neoprene that just rolls up and we put it down on the table when we're when we're playing games uh and it's it's much better than working on a wood or cloth surface because it like the cards and pieces and stuff move freely. It's really easy to manage. Oh. It was like 50 bucks. You can get them custom sized for your table with the right curves and stuff if you want. Um, but I, I I can't I literally can't recommend it highly enough. It is a wow. fabulous addition if you play a lot of board games. That sounds cool. Um, here is an email from Jan or perhaps Jan. Did I just get extremely lucky or is there no need for regular fresh installs of Windows nowadays? I'm running a machine I built in 2015, and I actually never, not even once, did a reinstall. Uh, it is, aside from a new GPU, a second SSD, and me having to reseat my DIMMs once, uh, it has been running for almost 10 years now. No software issues, no hardware failures, nothing. Uh, from basically all of my old builds prior to this one, I remember me having to reinstall Windows every so often, like once a year at least, uh, really feeling the need for a fresh install. Uh, since Windows 10, though, I've never felt that urge. Uh, as I often hear you and other people from the tech world talking about reinstalling Windows every so often, I was just wondering, would you still recommend a fresh install or is this just an out of date habit? I I haven't. My machines generally stay pretty unreinstalled yeah, these days. Yeah, same, same. Like I, I'm at this point and I can say this because I've been through like multiple builds in the last couple of years. I'm pretty much like a one one good solid install at build time. And then I'm kind of good from there. It seems like these days. Yeah. So the the if you upgrade motherboard, specifically motherboard, I think yeah, you can that, even upgrade yes. CPU. Although, like AMD had some requirements about upgrading, reinstalling Windows when you move from like a, um, a two compute chiplet uh, CPU to a one compute chiplet, or vice versa. Yeah, I've seen um, that. They they've since fixed that. So now it just detects and reconfigures when you reinstall the chipset drivers. But um, but yeah, generally speaking you can you just need to reinstall if you upgrade motherboard more than yeah, anything that's that's the big one for me i will always do a fresh install on a new motherboard now i will tell you when my daughter's computer conked out and i switched her from intel to amd i did the thing that's not a good idea to do but i didn't have time to do a full reinstall and move all of her stuff over i i <laughs> i booted it into the old windows install and installed all the new drivers and then i opened up uh device manager and i clicked the show hidden options show hidden, oh, hidden no. item things uh -oh. and then just deleted all the oh. show hidden items well you know i mean that's not the worst thing you could do that was like three years ago it's still been fine she yeah. uses it all the yeah. time so yeah. you know your mileage may vary yeah um, it, it, windows has gotten much more resilient is the, is the short version yeah and i think it's the windows 10 i think the windows 10 cut a, cut over is the one um, I feel like the way that they manage Windows installs now is much more robust than it used to be. And you're much less likely to have a bunch of old cruft hanging around that impacts your perf. Yes. Um, the the other thing that I think people will do an upgrade for or reinstall for is if they have some sort of malware attack. That's mm -hmm. that's a I, I would generally recommend that. 
Yeah. Uh, operating systems like in general have just gotten a lot more resilient. They're like, they're, they're much more like, I don't want to use the word containerized because that has a specific meaning in computing these days, but like they're much more kind of sandboxed and siloed off where they're like, like Mac OS is the extreme example of that where the system volume in Mac OS is read only these days. Yeah. So it can't be messed with. So there is no point in reinstalling there. You can just do the option that wipes all the user data and you've got a fresh system again. Like, you know, we talk about like immutable Linux distros and like, I know even windows has gone in a more like sandbox direction in ways. So like, but I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. Well, there's stuff that windows is doing too. Like, um, like if you have a, if you have, if you don't have permission to install an application, you try to install an application instead of either failing or requiring you to elevate it often will just put it in your app data folder now in a special installation location. Stuff like that means that if you have a problem, you can fix it by nuking your profile and creating a new one. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's as it should be. That's, yeah. that's how Unix has worked for decades and it's nice that windows has caught up. Yeah. Uh, all right. I've got like a trio of emails here that are more like, uh, FYIs than questions, I would say. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's one from Pat. Uh, listening to the last Q&A, you mentioned all of our outlets, electrical outlets, should not be the face, meaning the two prongs and then the ground on the bottom that makes kind of a little face. As yeah. we all know in the U.S., as the only way you ever see electrical outlets installed, basically. Apparently it's not to code. Uh, uh, they should be flipped upside down. So we, you know, we talked about that last time. You mentioned all outlets should not be the face. They should be flipped upside down. The reason for that is that you put the ground at the top so that if something metal slips down between a loose plug and the wall, it doesn't arc between the positive and negative terminals. It just hits the ground and doesn't complete the cert. So I saw two different responses to this. One was this one from Pat, which is, which is, I believe that the, the rationale. The other thing I saw was somebody who linked to a YouTube video and I can't remember what the YouTube video was. I want to say it was technology connections, but I'm not hundred percent where they tested this to see if it actually works to see if, if it's possible to have a partially unplugged U S style outlet and have something drop across it in short. And they couldn't make it happen like randomly. I mean, would it have to be also contacting the ground at the same time? No, it would or just no. have to be or no, it so, would just travel through the object, right? It would have to go the trick. The problem was it would always bounce off the wall or roll or whatever. So like a screwdriver because of the thickness of the handle was too thick to fit down in that gap. So it was a low percentage. The, the upshot was maybe apocryphal. Okay. Couldn't make it happen, I mean, but it seems like the kind of thing an engineer would come up with. Right, right. I mean, to really test that, you kind of have to do an artificial test, right? You have to like very carefully place a metal object across the two prongs and make sure everything's touching and see what happens. But yeah, like, I did that as a kid once. It uh, made a really big spark, a huge bang, and then shut off the electricity in half of the house. And then I got yelled at. Weird. That sounds fun. Yeah. The, the, my close calls with electricity are varied and long. Yes. Um, here's one from Evan. Uh, near, the, near the beginning of episode 261, you guys had some trouble with the word flanger. Uh, the term flanging comes from mastering audio on magnetic tape. They would play two copies of the same track on tape decks running at the same time, and someone would push on the flange of one of the reels, causing it to slow down and fall out of sync with its counterpart, resulting in the, quote, flange effect. Thought you might find this interesting, and hopefully it clears up the pronunciation. I love, I love how many... I love it when something has a deeply analog origin, mm -hmm. right? Like, like there was another one, somebody else was talking about an effect where you'd pull extra tape out and then th pull it through faster or slower um, on a, on an old reel to reel. Yeah, this is, this is cool. Thank you for sending this in, Evan. Yeah. Um, last one of those that I mentioned is from Cullen regarding mid duty pay once audio editing software. What you want is called Reaper. We got I've, a lot I've, of this. Yeah, I've been staring at Reaper for years. I, I'm, just, I, I'm just intimidated by it. I spent a good amount of time learning to use Reaper about right when we started this podcast. Like, yeah, like you, you, uh, you were running, you weren't you running Ultra Shawl? Yeah, I tried that. That was a disaster. Which is a, the sort of podcast sing plugin. Is, does it have an official plugin? It's, it's just like an overlay. overlay. Or is this more of a mod for it's, Reaper? It's, it, it, yeah, it's closer to like a game mod than ever, anything else. You download Reaper and you pay for it and then you upgrade with this with this overlay that's mostly in German, but has a kind of iffy English translation. The The upshot on Reaper was um, I couldn't. There were two problems, if I recall. One was that it was hard to sync because the the waveforms displayed on the thing that we used to sync didn't always exactly line up in the right places with where they were and the stretching audio in, in Reaper was challenging. Um, 
the other problem was that I couldn't get it to sound right. The, the bigger problem was that I couldn't get it to sound right. So we had we had issues getting um, like we use a our audition tool chain. Uh, basically, I couldn't replicate it in a way that made both of us sound the same way we usually do. Right. And that's, uh, to be clear, that's not that's not a knock on Reaper or to say that you can't do it in Reaper like uh, as so much as you just didn't get there because like to, to be clear, Reaper is extremely highly respected. Yeah, I, I, I was doing it at a time when I didn't have a ton of free time. So uh, it's entirely possible that I could do it now. Um, and I should probably actually revisit. I think my license is still valid, but I'll have to check. Uh, it's 80 have, bucks. It's a it's a 150 it's for old, commercial, I think. Last, last night is 225. Last I checked, it was 60 for personal and 225 for commercial. OK, and we would we would need commercial, obviously, because we are using yeah. it for commercial purposes. But um, their upgrading policy is extremely generous. Also, since we're talking about pay once software. Yeah. You get you get all of the major version you buy and all of the next one as well. So if That's, you buy like if you they're on 7.27 right now, but if you bought it at 7.01, you get all the way up through 8.99 on a license, which is yeah, that, pretty, that's pretty generous. That's pretty amazing. Um, Re- Reaper is a full on DAW. Like it's just I think it's just more than I need. Like Audacity has been getting a lot better, actually. You remember we had Martin on the Fosspod? Yeah. Uh, not super long after he and Muse Group took over Audacity. Like, it, Audacity has been a little bumpy as they've been adding a bunch of new features to it, but it's finally, they're working out a lot of the bugs and stuff. So it's it's more meeting my needs now than it has been in the past. So I think I'm okay with it. But, like, I, I've, I've, I've been interested in Reaper for a long time, but I think it's just way more, way more DAW than I need. Like, to put it in perspective, I went to their site and pulled up the user guide. 460 pages yeah it's a it's a lot um it's 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 yeah like the 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 unfortunate thing about audition is it really shoots the gap in the way that like the affinity software does on the on the graphic design side where it does like most of the things that you need and the stuff that it doesn't do you're probably fine without like it has it has like the neat thing about reaper is you can use daw plugins and get like whatever you can get a software mimic of whatever weird compressor that you want right i don't need i don't know how to work that i just need a compressor <laughs> sure i just need a noise gate mm-hmm. you know it's it's yeah it's a little different market yeah. yep. um but i'll 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 explore reaper again it's free to try too so yes um, yeah they have they have a generous uh, and, trial period i believe yeah it's 60 days full full functionality uh, yeah. no weird no no voice no weird audio prints nothing weird about it you can just try it yeah um, and also you don't need the commercial license unless you make more than $20,000 a year oh. gross revenue. So also, I think I mentioned this every time it comes up. Fun fact, it's developed by Justin Frankel, the creator of Winamp. Oh, that's cool. Shout out to Justin Frankel. Whips the llama's ass. Hey, fun. Where are they now? Uh, all right. Uh, why don't we dive into some discord questions here? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Um, gosh, there's so many of them. Uh, there's a lot of good people people you can tell the winter months are upon us because the questions improve dramatically yes uh dc actual has a good question why do games need to compile shaders on my pc is everyone set up so unique that they can't just have an amd and nvidia set of shaders oh boy the short answer is yes it is it's not just it's not just hardware it's it's cpu and gpu combination it it uh also so for people who don't know the shaders are the things that, that like they're little tiny programs that are passed from the cpu to the gpu that describe how typically surfaces are manipulated but sometimes it's vertexes and stuff like that yeah you can actually do all kinds of weird stuff in shader programs like fluid simulation and stuff like that but yeah yeah like it's fur yeah. fur shaders fur, for grass example. a yeah. lot of like leaves transparency yeah. on leaves where light shines through them stuff like that yeah there's a bazillion little shader programs that run on every game and when you play on a console because there are even in the case of the xbox there's only two SKUs of Xbox Series X and two SKUs of Xbox or three SKUs of Xbox One. You just pre-compute all of those and you bundle them up and you download the right one for your console when you download the game. Um, with with PCs, it's a little more complicated because it's the the configuration of the specific GPU you have, the specific CPU you have and your graphics driver revision. So what happens is when you update your graphic drivers, often you have to recompute the shaders. Yeah, because I, I would assume whatever interpreter or compiler and runtime they use or the shaders is even changing from driver version to driver yeah, version. Yeah, if you do like if you if you and renderer too. So if you switch from Vulkan to DirectX 12, 
or vice versa, you'll have to recompute shaders often in that case. Yeah, and I, and I will also would assume <clears throat> the architecture of the compute units changes at least subtly from one graphics card generation to the next. Like too many variables to account for here is the point. Like oh. they could never they could never precompile shaders that would cover every use case. The- my understanding is that capability can change even within the same family. So like yeah. if you have 3000, a 3000 series, like a 3040, which is a mobile part, I think. Oh, or that would you, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, then there'll sense. be a complete different shader computation for that. From, from a 3090. Now, um, the, the, so the reason you do this is because the engines have to, what's the right way to say this? When you encounter a surface that uses a shader or a material that uses a shader in the game, which is constantly right, if it's not already compiled, the game will have to compile it ideally before that frame starts rendering. Uh, Digital Foundry has done a bunch of great stuff about what what shader compiling is and how it works. So you should go check out their YouTube and and dig into that if you're if you're curious and want to know more. But they um, when those shaders compile, it's going to cause a hitch if it happens on the same frame or even sometimes a frame or two before because it has to happen on the CPU and it stalls the whole thing while it waits for that compiled shader to land. It, it, some games, some engines will do the compiles like a few frames in advance, right? Cause they can see the frames in the future and they'll know, Oh, we need this one. Let's do this shader compile real quick. It still can cause hitches. Cause then you're sa- you're saturating memory buses and stuff like that. Um, now there's ray of light on the steam deck because it's a fixed platform. Valve just precompiles the shaders for everything and you download them when you download a Steam Deck game and it says, hey, I'm downloading your precompiled shaders and then you don't have to do that on the Steam Deck, which is really nice. Theoretically, there's a world where we could, when we compile our shaders for Call of Duty on our Steam game, it says, hey, do you want to upload this? And the first person who does that uploads it and, it, and just everybody else downloads their precompiled shaders from that point forward for the exact same hardware configuration. Now, whether that's a good idea in practice, I don't know. It seems like it's probably a probably some security concerns there, if nothing else. But also, it's it means that Valve would have to maintain a giant database of all the graphics cards, all the configurations, all the sub configurations inside there, and all the drivers and all that. And it's probably easier to just spend ten minutes compiling shaders when you install a new game. Yeah. Um, the thing I'm confused about in this context is why more games don't just do the upfront like lengthy shader pre compilation. Like I think Call of Duty does that, but you don't see it that often for how many people are out there very vocally despising the shader stutter you get in games for the reasons you're talking about like yeah surprise more games don't take the preemptive step of just pre-computing everything before you start i wonder i really just wonder is like they don't want the bad look of having somebody fire up their new game and then having to sit and watch progress bar for 10 minutes i mean part of it is that elden ring is a good example of this because elden ring every time you hit a new shader you get a frame hitch yeah and it and it stinks um the People really complain about the hitches more than anything else on Steam reviews. Like if you have micro right. stutter on, a, on, you're going to get mostly negative on launch That's on terrible. Steam reviews. Like, I would absolutely rather wait an extra 10 minutes to pre-compile everything versus deal with the stutter. But I also wonder, is it even possible to account for everything you would need to compile in a preemptive fashion? Well, so like as with most things, if you think about it up front when you're starting, then yeah, you can flag everything and have a compi- uh, shader compilation step in your in your initial install. If you didn't flag all of those and you started writing shader programs, and just to be clear, like in Unreal or a Unity, writing a shader program is opening up the blueprint editor and connecting a couple of materials to each other and connecting a couple of scripts that probably shipped with Unreal or one of your graphics programmers wrote. And and like you can make a bazillion shaders without realizing you're making a bazillion shaders. So if if your data is clean and everybody's flagging stuff appropriately, it'll do it. But the engine doesn't just do that for you. You have somebody along the way, like the engine will let you write shaders and the engine will let you precompile shaders. But somewhere along the way, somebody has to make a list of all of the things that need to get past the precompiler so that it happens. And, um, you know, Call of Duty Activision is typically pretty good at this because people really give a shit about micro stutter in competitive first person shooters. Uh, Fortnite handles this by just doing it the first time you load the map every time they update the map or you update your drivers, which means sometimes you load up a game of Fortnite and you get to the end of the flight path and you'd load in right at the very end because you're compiling shaders through the entire lobby waiting period. Um, it, it's th- like, there's no perfect solution for this. Unfortunately, the, the, the actually the perfect solution is that the graphics card vendors maintain a list of 
known good because they actually probably have the infrastructure to test and generate these in advance and they're generating them and uploading them and delivering them to you through drivers or through nvidia app or whatever you know the Ryzen master or whatever sure yeah radio problem yeah it's a complicated problem for sure um okay how about a question from tactical tug I've been going through the backlog of episodes lately, and in episode 139, Brad seems a little surprised about apartments having washing machines. Is this not a normal thing in the U.S.? For me, growing up and living in Norway, it seems like the most common thing ever, and I don't think I've ever been in a house or apartment that hasn't had a washing machine. Uh, And if it is common for apartments not to have their own washing machine, why? Please explain this. Thanks. I think for the purpose of this question, they're, they're definitely talking about in the unit, right? Not in the building. I would assume so. Yeah. Uh, I have never seen an apartment in uh, that. Maybe I had an apartment. I'm trying to think if I might've been like in a really nice one downtown once or twice that might've had their own washer dryer. I had, I, I had my last two apartments had washers and dryers. Well, in the city, at least I should in be the city. I should yeah. be clear. Uh, I'm trying to think like, um, I mean, I think I had to buy them. I think I provided them really. Yeah. Uh, we, let's see the, the apartment I lived in Raleigh, but that was almost more of like a duplexy townhouse townhousey kind of apartment like that. Yeah. That definitely had, um, it, had, when had you live in the there. urban areas, it seems like it's a little more in, rare in cities. I have I've never lived in an apartment in San Francisco that had washer dryer in the unit. So we had, I mean, in fairness, we didn't look at apartments that didn't have washers dryers in the unit after the first place we lived, it didn't have one. And that was not good for us. That sucks. I hate it so much. Yeah, it's really nice to be able to just wash laundry whenever you want. It sure is. Um, like, to be clear, we have one in the garage here, which is you just walk down a flight of stairs, so it's not the end of the is world. It, but, is it coins? But it is coin op, which is the problem. And it's like, you know, it's three bucks total to wash and dry a load, which is not terrible, but that means you have to keep quarters around all the time, which is a real pain. Yeah. I, have a, I have a friend who lives in Burlingame, and their apartment doesn't have in unit, but it has in the basement. And it's just a constant it's a constant struggle of her going to the bank all the time to right. get coins. Yeah. Like that. My girlfriend, God bless her is on coin duty. She goes to the bank every six weeks or something and takes a gang of quarters out. And then, you know, occasionally you have to fight, not fight, but you have to you know, wait on somebody else to yeah. finish their laundry, which is generally fine. Unless you're one of those people and nobody in this building is, thank God. But the type of people who leave their laundry done in the dryer for like nope. hours. Nope is a very awkward situation. I, so before we had the internet connected washing machines, I put a motion sensor. I just stuck a motion sensor on the side of our old washing machine side of the dryer. So I could tell when it was running, because it would, they vibrate enough that it was triggering the motion sensor. And then you'd know that it was off when it was off and it would pop you a notification. Mm -hmm. Um, I would totally do that if I had basement units, uh, because then you'd know the moment it's done, you can just walk down there. Yep. I, I, um, I don't know why it is. I think it's because we don't require it. Like San Francisco added a requirement that people had to have, uh, dishwashers a few years ago as a water really? conservation measure. Oh, um, and people were really like, obviously landlords were very upset about it because it's mm-hmm. another $800,000 thing that they have to put in the units. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it seems like a thing. It, it, it seems like a necessity. I think there's also a difference in, Europe versus most of North, most of the United States, where there's an expectation that eventually you buy a house if you can. That would um, be nice. In the Bay Area, that's not exactly the case because nope. houses are prohibitively expensive here. Yep. Um, but in in most of the you know the non like where renting is a is a not a renting is weird here in the United States, I guess mm-hmm. outside yes. of urban areas, especially. Sure. Or just anywhere. Or anywhere. Yeah. Actually, uh, I should just move straight on to this question from I think we're alone because it's kind of about living in this area. Uh, I'm in my fourth year studying computer science in Canada and will be graduating this spring. I'm planning on pursuing a master's next year and possibly a PhD. Uh, I'm currently applying to several schools in Canada, but also a couple of top schools in the U.S. that specialize in my interests. Among these are Stanford and Berkeley. My question is, what's it like living in California? Attending a top U.S. school has some advantages, but living in California seems hard to imagine. Is it as dense and chaotic and expensive as it sounds to an outsider? Is living in and around Silicon Valley really a career advantage? Isn't it an, is it an enjoyable lifestyle or one you put up with? Uh, for some context, I have lived in larger and smaller cities across Canada and attended larger and smaller universities. 
My current city and school are smaller, and I think that has contributed to my success. Uh, we have great schools here in Canada, but my impression is that attending a Stanford or Berkeley could be a career maker. What do you think? Um, so living, okay, there's a lot to unpack here. Start, let's start at the back. Going to Stanford, if you want to work in a tech startup situation, is absolutely a career maker. It can be. Like, like is that for is that for networking reasons as much as for, for both educational? Like I assume you're just gonna you're gonna be immersed in nothing but other people who want to do the same thing. I mean, if you're studying the right thing at the right time, you know, people were hiring PhDs out of Stanford for AI stuff a couple of, currently probably for hundreds of thousands of dollars a year yeah. and and putting them in research labs and stuff like that, right? Yeah, like funding research, the whole deal. And also this is, I mean, this is more of kind of a unicorn thing, but if you read about the history of so many startups that have become giant companies, it's kind of funny to find out how often the founders were like PhD candidates, you know, like they, like Google, for example, I think like weren't, they were Stanford, Stanford Brandon, students. Yeah. And who's the other guy? Pay, not Page. Sir, Sergey Brennan, Larry Page. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, they, they were, they were like doctoral candidates who took their like algorithmic research and turned it into Google page rank. They, yeah, they example. took the thing that they were working on for their doctorate. Right. Right. Um, you'll find th there's a networking component too, where people you'll meet people who are in the programs with you who end up going like, even if you, it doesn't work out for you, it'll work out for somebody else. And that like, say what you will, it smooths the way, right. Um, good or bad. It's phenomenally expensive depending on where you are in Canada, like compared to Vancouver, it's not super expensive. It's similar kind of price range. Toronto is also co fairly comparable. I think these days. But but compared to anywhere else in North America outside of like New York and Vancouver and maybe Seattle and L.A., it is an incredibly expensive place to live. Yeah, extremely. Um, like, but like the South Bay, I think, is worse than San Francisco at this point. It it wildly varies. Yeah. Like you can like it depends on like if you if you're OK living in a in a like a, in, a, in a rental house with five other people, you can find some deals but it's, it's a, it's not, it is going to be more expensive than you think, even if you think it's really expensive. Yeah. Um, I, I like it here. The people yeah. are great. There's a live and let live attitude to the entire region. That's quite nice and refreshing compared to the rest of the United States. Yeah. Like other, honestly, other than the cost of living, I don't really have a lot of complaints. Like it's beautiful. It is yeah. just from a natural standpoint. Like it's one of the, and I'm five, we are both from, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I happen to think Western North Carolina is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. But this, Northern California is, is up there for sure. I, I miss green. Like the yeah. thing about Northern California is it's brown about nine months of the year. Well, it didn't used to be that bad. <laughs> you know, it used to be a lot better about that. I mean, it was, there, yeah. there was always, there's always been a dry period, but then we hit this period of years long drought where it was kind of always dry. Yeah. But, but I mean, even when it, even on years when it, when it rains the way it, the amount it usually does, it's still like you get up to Napa and stuff in the summer and it's brown, brown hills and brown. You're yeah. Like, like you don't, you're not wrong. I went to visit my parents in DC during the summer a couple of years ago and I, I forgot how green and dense the undergrowth is everywhere that there's not an active attempt to keep it from growing up on it. Right. Sure. It's swamps. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, like it's definitely weird. It's weird not having seasons for all intents. Yeah. Like we have, we have like wet and then the rest of the year. I do. Those, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I do actually miss the really pronounced seasons that I grew up with. Yeah. And, and that's like, a matter of taste, though. Yeah. I mean, and, and you, like you're probably good on winter having lived in Canada for a long time. Yeah. Um, and, the, incredible, the, incredible food area. Yeah, it's good, good. Good. Like lots of good food from around the world. Uh, San Francisco is one of the walkable, one of the few walkable cities in North America, I think. Mm -hmm. Or yep. like, you know, you don't have to have a car to live. Uh, the South Bay, a little bit less so. Yeah, you'd need a car down there for sure. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think it's like, if you, if you get into Stanford in a doctoral situation or a master's situation, it can punch your ticket in a way that is life changing. Yeah. It's not for everybody. You're still gonna have to work really fucking hard, but I, I would not hesitate to go to Stanford if you get into Stanford. I don't know if the outcome is the same for Berkeley. I feel like Berkeley is a little bit less of a, of a pull for that kind of career, by that kind yeah. of degree. I don't know. I don't know how it is these days. I mean, obviously yeah. <laughs> start to say in the late seventies, like BSD came out of there, like it was a big deal at one time, but yeah, that's been a while. Yeah. Um, all right. How about, um, 
unimaginative pseudonym. How do you clean your USB-C port on your phone? Say what you will about the lightning connector ports. They were easy to get pocket lint out of. I still have a lightning port, so I'm going to look at mine right now. Clean as a whistle. Yeah, mine, I, I use mine every day. I plug it into the car. Oh. And when I need it to clean it out, I just go like this. I get it right up, I get my mouth up to the hole, and I go. All right. Well, <laughs> and then it's clean. There's an audio demonstration for you. Yeah, you're welcome, America. Um, also, I have that little, br- I have a little brush. We've talked about it before, but I use it to clean off the keyboard and like dust the top of the microphone and stuff. And it has a little probe that is exactly the thickness to get in between the edge of the USB-C connector. And you can just kind of gently get it in there. Now, now here's a question I have for you and people listening. Yes. What is your default pocket orientation for your phone? Mine is right side up screen facing out. Oh, screen facing out. Are you mad? Well, well, no, I guess. Oh, I mean, sure. what if you bump into something? I mean, I'm just careful with my hip, I guess. Wow. No. Okay. So I'm left front pocket, uh, screen down glass toward my thigh screen down screen down. Meaning the top of the screen is toward my feet. Wow. So you're like completely the opposite of me. Well, so I can, so then when I put my hand in my pocket, I just whip the phone out. Yeah, no, I, I get the, yes, that's right. That makes sense. I I think, I think my, I haven't, first of all, I haven't thought about this in about 10 years, but I think my thinking at the time was, uh, the screen would withstand a lot more friction if it was up against your thigh. But, yeah, but I have a screen protector on mine, so I don't yeah, care. Yeah, I've, I've never done screen protectors. Also, like the phone glass used to scratch way worse 15 years ago than it does now. Well, so the thing is, if you look at a f- screen, the reason I do screen protectors still is that if you use the phone for two years and then you look at it in bright light where you can see all the micro scratches, mm-hmm. it's still going to have a ton of little tiny scratches yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, and they make me crazy and I can just peel off the screen protector and put a new $8 That's one on and there. Back in business. Yes. I mean, my real secret is I just don't care about the phone that much anymore. I mean, there is that. Uh, anyway, there you go. Let's see. This is um, this is a question I have been wrestling with myself. Okay. Um, Bertrand, how do you judge when to spend the extra money on purchasing parts or components from vendors with uh, track records for high quality parts versus whatever is cheapest, but legit looking on sites like Al- AliExpress or Amazon? Uh, these days, even the humble clip lead is no longer safe. As this video from Matthias Vondel shows, uh, I don't know what a clip lead is, but I gathered it's like an alligator clip. I was going to say, okay, yeah, electrical in nature. Yeah. Uh, He noticed higher than expected resistance across some new leads and found they were copper plated steel wire and could be picked up with a magnet. That is nuts. Um, So, okay, so I think it's a little disingenuous to jam AliExpress in with Amazon, although maybe not far. I I don't know if there's as much difference as you think. AliExpress is like, Dudes with sh- people with stalls yeah, in yes, Shenzhen. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. And Amazon is, I mean, but, but again, how many, but how many like, of those no name Amazon vendors are just drop shipping those same parts? I think it's more. I think it's a little more structured than that. But you're not wrong. Um, I think that I think for me, so I definitely buy stuff without logic from AliExpress without thinking about it. Right, like. When I wanted cheap keyboard switches, I bought bags, a couple of bags of them from from AliExpress, because even if they had high fail rates, they were cheaper than buying from like a boutique shop in the United States. And I and I could wait three months for them to arrive. I think when you start talking about things with logic, it gets a lot more iffy. Right. So like we we uh, we bought some like they're like Game Boy sized emulation boxes for six dollars from one of those sites aliexpress or timu or something oh we never and did our we never they were did so our... shitty they weren't even worth talking about <laughs> okay i have yours here if you want it it's eh, really really bad it's fine unusable um the the stuff like the copper plated steel wire is really like that that to me feels like the buying alligator clips is something i would buy from an electronics place yeah rather than amazon um Things, things that I buy from Amazon are things that are boxed goods that are reasonably easy to tell if they're counterfeit. So, for example, I would hesitate to buy. We talked about on the patron episode, this 15 in one cable tester for the continuity tester. I probably would buy that from an electronic supplier rather than Amazon. Yes. Right. But like a fluke multimeter that I that I can tell if is it's the real thing when I get it that I'd probably buy from Amazon. That seems OK. So if, if it's not something I can identify that it's a counterfeit or if I don't care that it's a counterfeit in the case of the keyboard switches, 
those are the two places I would probably go. I wow. just, I also know when I buy the keyboard switches that there's going to be a higher than expected fail rate because they don't test them at AliExpress. So I buy like 20% more than I need. Interesting. And it still ends up being way cheaper. I, I didn't realize that counterfeit keyboard switches would be a thing, let alone like okay to use. I guess, I guess it's not that complicated. Switch though. is a switch, man. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I ran into this problem just this week. I need to buy, I, I want three six foot USB three extension cables. Mm-hmm. Like no logic, no, no. I mean, that's just, that's just electrical signal being passed along. Right. Yeah. Uh, to run from the back of my NAS around my desk to where I can plug like external hard drives in easily. Every single extension cable. And again, this is just literally male to female USB three. That's it. Every single one I looked up on Amazon or places like that had some user review somewhere going like, Hey, this thing only rings up as USB two when I plug it in. Like, like my, the transfer speed is that of USB two when I do a transfer speed test and not what I was getting with a direct cable into the motherboard, you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's just concerns about signal integrity or th- things like that, not working right. Like the race to the bottom on parts like that has gotten so annoying, but I ended up just not buying anything. I was like, you know, mm-hmm. I have to, to be clear, <laughs> to be clear, the way my NAS is sandwiched behind the desk against the wall, I have to move furniture around to get to it, to plug things into it. And I, I finally threw up my hands. And I was like, I guess I'll just move furniture around every time I need to plug an external drive in and do it directly because I can't trust any of these extension cables I'm seeing. So I had that same problem um, when I was doing So I have a couple of these Anker uh, cameras that need, not Anker, uh, Elgato cameras that need a USB 3.1 connection to work um, because they're high high frame rate and high depth. Uh, The maximum length on USB 3 or 3.1 cables is nine feet. And what that means is that it works with most stuff at nine feet. But in reality, you really want six foot cables. Yes. Um, And I had to find I had to I had to go. I had the same exact problem. I went through some extenders uh, and I ended up just buying longer point to point cables. So instead of buying an extension cable, I would do whatever the a the fat a endpoint or whatever is. Yeah. And then you have just one cable because the extenders are the the problem isn't necessarily the cable. The problem is the length. The total length exceeds nine feet. Once you do the once you do the extension, the six foot extension plus the six foot cable that it comes with, probably, yeah, you know, I didn't account for that possibility that the people complaining were doing something inadvisable, maybe. Or also the more ma- the more physical connectors you have in the chain, the less distance you're going to yes. get out of it. Too. Yes, yes. Voltage drop um, and stuff like that. I mean, that does cut the versatility down dramatically to have to pick a specific connector to terminate on because some of the, a lot of these USB drives use the weird little hybrid um, micro USB with the extra notch on it. You know what oh, I'm talking about? Like, yeah, yeah. like that's, that's a pretty, pretty limited use case to, yeah. to hard kind of hard embed a cable in when I could have like a, a generic USB a to plug anything. into. Um, but so the other thing you could do is buy like a cheap Thunderbolt or USB USB dock and plug that in under the desk and then just have a cable that goes straight into that. That's true, actually. Um, and that gives you, then you'd have multiple ports coming out of that that are short. Yeah, I mean, and you're, at that point, you're limiting yourself to the bandwidth of a single port, but also it's hard drives. Like You're fine. Yes, USB 3 is 5 gigabits per second, so you're probably fine. You're going to be fine, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and anyway, like I, it's almost, it's almost like the mid-duty software thing. I kind of like, I'm ready for like a mid-duty sort of like electrical accessory cable brand to come along. Like I, you know, I would pay 30 or 40% more for cables that are like a hundred percent rock solid guaranteed to work. You said mid duty. What? You said mid duty. What? You said mid duty cable. Um, sorry, I'm an idiot. The, uh, this is what happens when we record two podcasts in a row. Mm. The, um, the thing, so the, the, this is the other reason I like Amazon for this stuff. I know Amazon, like there's a strike don't buy from amazon right now yada yada it's bad their return policy is really good on this stuff so if you yeah. buy a cable and it doesn't work then you just take it to the ups store around the corner from your house and you don't have to pay anything to ship it back oh i know yeah i know it's not yeah. it's not that the worst and it's more just the the you know if, if you're busy the time commitment of having to test and the uncertainty of is this yeah. working or not and like maybe it's not clear if it's not working up to spec or not and like yeah it's just it's just too much overhead. I so here's the other thought, and this is a little bit crazier. The other thing you could do, like a, I would expect most newer external drives to have USB C ports rather than the the mini extended ones. Now, 
you also could just shuck those drives and get a, a hard drive dock that you slam the drive oh, down yeah, into. That's, that's one of the things I have that I need to plug in. The, the, the crazy thing is that uses USB 3B. USB B3. Oh, the tall, the tall, like, uh, you the, remember the tall A plug? Yes, yes. Yeah. You, well, you remember, you remember regular USB B that you would plug uh-huh. like your printer into? Yeah. It used, so the drive enclosure I have uses a 3.0 version of that. So that's, yeah. that's the other reason that just getting a long cable is, is weird because that's even more specific than, than that, that, uh, um, yeah. micro. You, your factor. NAS also has a bunch of drive bays. You could just put one of those things inside, uh, a drive cage inside the, the five and a quarter inch drive bay. Those are, those are going to be full soon. Oh, okay. I bought, I bought some new drives. Oh, okay. 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 The, the shucks, the, the shucking, the shucking has been good. This, the shucking, this yeah. holiday <laughs> is the season. Yes. Uh, you can always tell when black Friday is cause the best deal on any drive price counter resets to zero on shucks dot top. Yes. Yes. On, on the, the 20 terabyte on shuck stop had an icon that I've never seen before that when you hover over, it literally says stop reading and buy this drive. <laughs> oh really? Cause, cause it was the historic all time low price on the 20 terabyte. Oh, that's really funny. Take I, my money, I, I laughed. I laughed out loud when I saw that and then I ordered the drive. Uh, anyway. All right. Um, how about, uh, annoyed and tired with a question aside from Apple wallet, do you recommend saving credit card information anywhere for quicker checkout? I do it for Amazon, but the impetus for the question stems from switching to a password manager, like one password. I keep my stuff in my password manager, uh, for two reasons. One is it makes it easy to fill in when you're buying stuff Two. If you ever lose your wallet or something when you're traveling, you have a record of the cards and I make sure I put the 800 number on the back of the card so I can call and cancel it. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's that's a good one for sure. Uh, I, I still I try to avoid saving card information with like retailer X like Amazon has mine for now. Yeah, I'm trying to think like B and H, I think I'd save one in there because I trust them. Well, I enough. save them everywhere. Everybody gets it. Really? Yeah. Uh. Or something, you know, like in, in the event of a breach, you just cancel the card immediately. And hopefully, that's the thing. hopefully that's things a bank are, problem, not my, my right. problem. Like generally the fraud protection should be good enough on a card. Now, debit cards is a totally different story. Debit cards like, are scary. Do not do not save your debit card information with anybody ever. Well, I mean, I keep it in my one password vault, but my one, oh, yeah. if, my, if my one password vault gets breached, I have larger problems. I, I met with a retailer. Don't, yeah. Don't don't save your debit card information with random retailers. Don't give your bank account information to people. Right. I mean, I think that's uh, the thing you have to do in Europe sometimes. But anyway. Yes. Uh, I've been thinking kind of like tangentially to this question. Like Apple Wallet is great, but I have been thinking about how much is tied up in my phone these days that. I, I resigned man, myself to that being unavoidable. Like I know more to the point. I've just kind of started thinking about like, man, if I ever lost my phone, it would be a real pain in the ass to disentangle all of the stuff I've got in there and have to set it up again somewhere else. Or in a lot of cases, lose access to it. Like, well, like the, I don't like I use genius scan to scan on documents into PDF. Yeah. I've, I've gone on a hardcore, like no hard copy crusade of like any, any, you know, Name something that comes in the mail on a sheet of paper that you don't want sitting around. Like I turn it into a PDF and then get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I, I should probably pay for the, the paid tier of genius scan that has iCloud sync. But right now all those PDFs are just on my phone, which is not great. Well, hold on. Dropbox just does that now. Do, do they do document scanning? Like they I know, do document I know, scanning, I, turn it into a PDF or yes, an image and it'll save it in a folder in your Dropbox is, and then it's covered. That is another issue i've been using genius scan since like 2010 and like i know the the notes app on ios also does that now so i probably also should just transition to something like that yeah just copy it over to something else although i haven't found anything that that does grayscale quite as well as genius scan maybe i should try dropbox's version like the notes app didn't do it as well where it turns it grayscale and flattens the document to make it look like it's photocopy Uh, but i should look at some more of those services that i actually do pay for and see how well they're doing it these days because i mean I actually feel bad for Genius Scan. I guess they got Sherlocked, but it sounds like everything I have does this functionality as well now. It was incredibly valuable like 10 or 12 years ago, and it was the only thing that did that. And I, yeah. I switched to Dropbox probably a decade ago and haven't looked back. Yeah, yeah. I'll check that out. Uh, okay, I got a couple of Mac questions here, actually. How about we start with this one from Patch, uh, which I do have an answer for, and then we'll do one that I'm a little more iffy on. But uh right third or fourth favorite version of logan from the x-men it's the one with the eye patch that's why they call him patch but he's not wolverine okay it took me a minute under no circumstances should you describe him as wolverine he's patch got it uh, all right patch asks 
With the recent changes in the Mac lineup, including backdating the minimum 16 gigabytes of RAM to both the M3 and M2 MacBook Air, do you think Apple has flipped the value proposition on its head to the point where they are a default recommendation for family and friends in the M4 Mac Mini base model and the updated M2 MacBook Air base model? Uh, what, what they're talking about here is that Apple went and recently, after, after being on minimum 8 gigabytes of RAM, yeah, for the, the cheap for the at, cheap version, right at the base, cheaper pricing for like what 15, 10, years? 15 years. Yeah. They finally just recently refreshed the entire product line company wide to uh, start at 16 gigabytes minimum. Thank God. I, I would say yes to this, but I also would have recommended it even before that, frankly. So having spent some time on the PC laptop side lately over at PC world, I, I am, um, it's it's weird. Like if you're in the thousand dollar laptop price range, I think that, yeah, it's a safe bet. Right. I think other people are making good laptops, but the, you have to do a little bit of re reading and research and the Apple laptops are pretty, pretty safe to recommend. The weird thing to me is that there's not a lot of stuff in the five hundred to thousand dollar or six hundred to thousand dollar range. Right. There's, like there's a lot of laptops in the under five hundred buck range. And there's a lot of stuff that's like there's a lot of gaming laptops that are like eight fifty to a thousand. But there's not a lot of like seven hundred dollar laptops that are worth buying, um, and and I think like for me a thousand like I I mean I've had a thousand I've been buying thousand dollar plus laptops for the last 10, 15 years, it still feels like too much money consistently, and um, I I think that using my wife's M one MacBook Air which is an eight gigabyte model, it doesn't. I was surprised by how not slow, like if I used a windows laptop that only had eight gigs of Ram in 2024, it would be unusable. Well, now there's a thing here that I think a lot of people don't really know that there is a big difference between the way Mac OS handles memory versus windows on laptops or just in general rather. Yeah. And the reason for that is that Apple runs their entire stack software and hardware from top to bottom. And the storage they are using in those laptops is so fast that it is actually an appreciable fraction of the speed of the RAM at this point. Their page file can be crazy fast, basically. And so, yes, they are on on uh, machines with lower amounts of memory. They're very aggressively paging out to this very fast storage, uh, which helps it feel way snappier than you, you would on Windows with an equivalent amount of RAM. That said, I've watched some like YouTube tests of the way this works, because, of course, I have. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that on an eight gigabyte machine, it's paging constantly. So you're wearing your SSD down. Yes. And on a machine where you can't re remove the SSD and replace it easily or at all, unless you send it to some specialty shop that'll solder new memory on for you or a new flash rather. Yeah. It is hitting the wear leveling on your storage pretty fast. I mean, is it going to be fast enough to like wear your storage out before the practical end of the laptop's lifespan? Like likely not, but it's still not amazing. Huh. Like, yes, I get, I get that eight gigabytes feels paltry and I sure, I sure got, 16 on my m1 a couple years ago when i had the choice but like it's not as bad as it would be on an equivalent windows machine i the the, the big thing for me is i hesitate to recommend an os change depending on the person right yeah like when my wife wanted to get a laptop a few years ago i was like you should look at the max and she tried it and she used it a lot in the return window because she was worried she might want to send it back because she was a windows person prior to that when um when but i would never recommend to my parents for example to switch to a mac at this point in their lives right it's too much change although buying a windows 11 laptop when they're used to windows 8 probably might be just as big a change so yeah. you know maybe rip the bandaid off i don't know yeah like maybe not as big a change but i definitely know what you mean like the, the number of people i see out there who switch from windows to mac and complain endlessly about things about mac os that really just amount to it's different than what i'm used to yeah, makes makes me think like you were spot on with this. Like a lot of people like you'll see you'll see people complaining about like hotkeys being different or like window f behavior being different, you know, and it's like, yeah, like that's not like really qualitatively better or worse. It's just different than what you're used to. Like a, 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 an individual person's tolerance for change and having to learn and adapt to, to new standards probably has a lot to do with whether you would get somebody to switch or not. I mean, just for what it's worth. As somebody who's used both a Mac and a PC regularly for a long time, having to switch which finger is the control equivalent, you know, is is always a pain. I always have to think about it. Yeah, you're not you're not wrong. Yeah. But, you know, when we st when I started at Whiskey, when I started a giant bomb. I moved to a Mac for the first time in my life. And like, yeah, there was absolutely a, a learning curve and an adjustment period. But once I got all the keyboard shortcuts dialed in and like set up a few little customizations, like I yeah. felt like I was 
way faster working in Mac OS than I ever was in Windows. You were young back then, though. Your brain yes. was still plastic. Well, well, also Windows has caught up in some ways, but like that's yeah. back when Expose was still fairly new and like the a lot of the window management stuff they were doing was pretty unique. And that was back in the days when we reinstalled Windows every year, whether it needed it or not. Yeah, indeed. Um, let's see. The other Mac question real quick here comes from another Brad. Uh, it, just to be clear, he signed it Brad. You yes. added the another yes. Brad. Yes, yes, I'm just saying it's not from me. Potential substitute Brad's. Uh, this is an email, actually. Uh, as I'm slowly dipping into the Apple ecosystem after being a longtime Android and PC person, the announcement of the updated Mac minis has sparked a very strange question. How would you view the viability of the new M4 Mini as a light gaming option? Have games on Steam and Epic started to account for the new chips and work well enough to consider? I, uh, I don't, it depends on the game, right? Yes. That, so this is the other question that I mentioned earlier that I, I'm interested in, but don't have a great answer for. Like Steam, last I checked, Steam still does not have a native ARM client on Mac. You would have to run, run the x86 Steam with Rosetta. And I think that would probably go for most games as well, but I don't actually know. Yeah. It, and it's weird. Cause like, for example, Frostpunk two has a Mac build, right? Brand relatively new game came out this year. Your, your selection of games that are available to you is going to be very low compared to an X86 or, or whatever, you know, you a, a, a more open platform. Yeah. Um, now, the thing you do get is access to Apple Arcade, which I think has Mac games. Yes. Um, I, I looked when I when we got this question, I tried to figure out how to see which games were available on Mac in the Mac App Store. And you can't I can't I can't see it on my computer on a personal yeah, computer. I, think, I don't think I think they filter that by what platform they detect you using. Right? It just says, which hey, really these sucks. Are, yeah, these are the apps you love from a place you can trust. And I'm like, well, that's not what I'm looking for. But like, for example, Valheim is available on the Mac App Store. So Goat Simulator is available. Well, there's five different versions of Goat Simulator on the on the Mac App Store. You know, actually, now that, now that you mentioned it, they are starting to push more games like on iOS, you know, Death Stranding, Assassin's Creed Mirage, Resident Evil 4. Like there are games showing up there that I think also work on Mac OS. I think the stuff you're going to see is the stuff that has enormous cross uh, genre, cross generational impact like five five nights at freddy's all of those are available on the mac app store it looks like oh yeah. nope that's ipad sorry the um this is the other thing that's the problem with browsing this preview thing is you have to keep drilling down to see if you can get into them and and it mixes up the mac and the uh, and the ios stuff pretty reliably the 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 big thing i think if you're going to live that mac life you're probably looking at cloud stuff so you're going to sign up for geforce now or maybe xbox game pass and play stuff through there would be my guess uh, <laughs> the dark horse option here really want to get insane is install, uh, Asahi Linux on it instead. Yeah. And, and then, then you can, then you can use all the proton, uh, Linux based valve stuff to play way more games, but you're going to have multiple translation layers. Cause you're going from x86 to arm though, at that point. And uh, yes, and it's going to, I think that that experience is going to be bad. I don't know for sure. Uh, I mean, I've seen people say it's actually quite good at this point, oh, but the, well, the, the bigger thing is I've, I've kept an eye on Asahi for a while and I think they're, they're getting there slowly, but surely, but there are still like, I think there are still fairly major components of the hardware that aren't supported yet. It's, it's, like it's an it, it, that's always going to be an inimical relationship between Apple yes. and the people making that, and it's not going to be what you want. Yeah, the, the people making Asahi from everything I've seen seem incredibly smart, but also yes, it's like they're swimming upstream against Apple's closed ethos. That that said, the new Mac Minis are some hot business, and yeah, and, and I think the price is really catching people's eye because the isn't the base M4 Mac Mini like five ninety nine. Is it really that cheap? Holy I cow. believe is the case. That's the cheapest Mac that you could buy for for. In recent memory, yes, I believe that's the case. How many starts at five ninety nine? There you go. Yeah, that's a, that's that is a that is a cheap computer. It is a very very fast one. Um, on 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 the just I'll, I'll say on the Asahi topic, I I look forward to putting Asahi on my M one MacBook Pro in like say five or six years. Is that when you retire it from your day to day yeah, use, whenever yeah. that laptop feels like it's no longer my daily driver, I look forward to putting Linux on it. At that point, that seems right. All right. Shall we close with this cake batter question? Oh boy. Yeah, I'm ready. You're going to have to help me fill out a list here. Can we get a chart tier list? I think the line chart is a tier 
and the Smith chart is S tier. I don't even know what a Smith chart is. Well, that's because you're not over on Wikipedia on wikipedia.org slash wiki slash chart. Oh, wow. Looking at the list of common charts and less common that. charts. Look at that. That is, that's a beautiful chart. Uh, which one is the, oh, the Smith chart. Oh boy. That's like a, it's like looking down a hole. I know it's, there's something, there's a, there's a dimensionality to it. It looks 3d in a way. I mean, I'm a fan of the Smith chart personally. Okay. I so I don't, I don't know that I could drive a lot of useful information from it personally, but it looks cool. This is like, a, maybe this is our April fool's episode. There's like 50 different kinds of charts on this, oh, on God. this page here. Oh God. We have, um, let's just do the, the most, let's just do common charts. Cause there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 there. Okay. We have the histogram, the bar chart, the pie chart, the line chart, the timeline chart, the org chart or organizational chart, the tree chart, a flow chart, area chart, cartogram, which appears to be a map <laughs> with stuff overlaid on it, pedigree chart, and the radial tree. Um, so like tree chart is like a hey, you start with one thing at the top and it spreads out to have other things underneath it. Kind of like a pedigree chart, but a pedigree chart seems to be purely uh, genomics related. Yeah, yeah a pedigree chart is what you imagine like a family tree looking yeah. like. A flow chart obviously start with one place and go through a series of decisions to get to the other end. Mm -hmm. uh, area charts are just line charts with stuff underneath them. That's uh, easy. I'm, I'm Trying to figure out like the, the distinction between a histogram and a bar chart seems somewhat academic. Histogram is a is a count of is a is a chart is listing counts and the it's a specific bar chart. Okay. So so all histograms are bar charts, but not all bar charts are histograms. I am not a statistician, but I'm gonna okay. say yes. <laughs> all right. Um a histogram is a series of tabular frequencies uh shown as adjacent rate rectangles erected over discrete intervals mm. with an area equal to the frequency of the observations in the interval first introduced by Carl Pearson. Of course. That literally sounds exactly like a bar chart. Of course. Um, okay. I'm going to say as, as it is uh, international pie for breakfast day in the United States today, mm -hmm. pie number one, S tier. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, Smith, Smith chart also S tier. Yeah. I mean, that's not in this, uh, this list of 12 basic charts that you have defined, but sure. Look, people might d uh, accuse me of bias. The Smith chart rings. looks right. Like it's like, yeah. again, it looks, it looks, there's an element of the artistic to it. Yeah. And also phenomenal naming, you know, like a good, a good plain bar chart, easy to read, communicates well. You know, I think, no, I think it's too easy to manipulate because you can change the mm -hmm. scale on a bar chart. Like you can't change the scale on a pie chart, right? It's always a hundred percent. That's fair. That's, you know, you're right. Actually, the number of, the number of like Fox news infographics I've seen that very misleadingly manipulate the scale. Yeah. Like you, you uh, cut off the last, you cut off all, but the last 2%, the 2% mm -hmm. that shows the change on a bar yep. chart. Yep. And it looks like crime stats are a nightmare. So it sure does. Yeah. So bar chart F for me How about the line chart, similar problem. Of scale. I, mean, I like time over data though, or data yeah. over time. Yes. Yes. Same. That's nice. And without a line chart, you wouldn't have an area chart. I think I like the area chart better. That does look anything that looks like it should be on a scientific instrument is cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think a line chart's a solid C for me. Okay. All right. I don't know. What do you think? Where, where would you put it? Line charts. Eh, like a B, maybe. B, okay. Um, I think an area chart's better. I think an area chart's A for sure. Is there a TikTok sure. filter to make this easier? I'm having trouble keeping up with where we are with everything. That's that's just everything these days. Org chart F. Wait, where's the org chart? It's, a, it's oh, under other yes, common there charts. Is, there is, yes. Yeah. Uh, sure. Nobody, I don't know. Just make everything should be flat. Everybody's in charge. It's useful. Yeah. Is it? Is it really? Yes. Can I can I see the anarchists organizational chart? What's the just org chart for line. TechPod? It's just two two boxes right next to each other. Yep. Yep. Perfect org chart right there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Flow chart's pretty good though. Right? Like you describe an algorithm with a flow chart. Yes. Or a circuit. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. Let's uh, put flow charts like an A. I think that feels like a strong A to me. Uh, tree charts. I'm trying to figure out how the tree chart differs. Differs. <laughs> if we got to end this podcast, I'm trying to figure out how the tree chart differs from the pedigree chart. I think the tree chart doesn't rank. It doesn't even have a wiki page. There's no link for it. I oh, think wow, we nix right. it. F tier. Yeah, okay. Yep. Doesn't count. 
Yeah, pedigree chart. I don't know. With it, Mendel seemed to be into them. Again, I feel like we should just reiterate. If you really want to, if you really want to get the most out of this extremely engaging conversation, go to the chart page on Wikipedia to see yeah, all these pictures. Down to common charts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and, I don't know, then, man. And then go and then go look up the Smith chart because you need to see it. Yeah, it's down further. You can scroll down and see it. I I'm gonna say I think pedigree pretty high. Yeah. I don't know B C. Right. Sure. This reminds me of the question we didn't do this quite the question, but it was like, hey, it was about pain thresholds. Oh right, yes. We'll have to save that one. Yeah, we can do that next month. I, I, we this, we talk about this occasionally internally. Sometimes I I would like to do a supplemental Q and A from time to time because we have so many good questions that we don't have time to get to. This month there was a an embarrassment of riches, but there's there's a concern about doing too many Q and As. So if you have an opinion out there in the audience about how many yeah. Q and As is too many, let us know. Um, tree map, tree map down in the less common charts. I'd put that as an S tier. That looks like that to me. Looks like uh wind disc wind deer stat right sure. there yeah. which is which sure. is what it is um yeah i don't know man I was, i'm gonna say okay i think pi s tier smith s tier clearly flow chart a or uh area chart a line chart b bar chart d you know how many c's Let's just chuck cartogram and T chart and t- uh, tree chart and timeline chart into C's. All right. I'm good with that. And uh, yeah, I, I have to confess, I don't have very strong feelings about most of these charts. Yeah, I'm I'm I look, I took statistics for business because it qualified as my statistics requirement for my science degree because I didn't want to take real statistics. It was sure. scary and hard. I could I could see that. Yeah. It turned out to be a mistake. It would yeah. have made a lot of my further downstream classes a lot easier if I knew the mm. science statistics stuff no instead way. of knew about Gantt charts and a bunch of bullshit. But, you know, here we are. We This is how we learn. Why, um, why tackle today what you can put off for 30 yeah, years? You give 30 years, 35 years. Exactly. Um, I guess that'll do it for us this week. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Hope everybody in the United States had a good Thanksgiving and everybody else had a nice Thursday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the... The fourth best day of the week. I made a joke this morning because uh, somebody was talking about Canadian Thanksgiving and Black Friday deals not being good in Canada. And I was like, well, it's because don't you guys celebrate Black Friday in October or something, right? Didn't it didn't land that joke. No. That joke didn't play. I was disappointed. Yeah. Well, um, better luck next year. Yeah. Maybe with a little luck. Uh, as always, Brad will made a tech pod is a listener supported show. We wouldn't be here without you all. The listeners. Uh, and we appreciate everybody who listens to the show and leaves reviews and all that stuff. Uh, but we especially appreciate people who support the show uh, via the Patreon, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash tech pod, where for five dollars a month, you get access to the discord. You get access to um, the monthly patron episode, which we just recorded before we did this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you get to join the community on the on the on the discord, which is, like I said, full of beautiful nerds who who are just it's just a good scene up there. You should check it out mm-hmm. uh, again. It's patreon.com slash tech tech pod. And uh, since this is the last episode of the month, we want to thank in addition uh, to our executive producer to your patrons. We also want to thank our associate producer to your patrons. So I'm going to start with executive producers, uh, including Andrew Slosky, Bunny Fiend, Crow, David Allen. James Kamek, Jordan Lippett, Twinkle Twinkie, and Pantheon, makers of the HS3 high-speed 3D printer. Thank you also so much. Yeah, thank you. And since it's a associate producer time, we want to thank our associate producer level supporters as well, including Alejandro Navarro, Andre M. Burke, Andrew Dicey Scholdice, Arthur Geese, Ben Tallman, Brutal, Brutal Kerfuffle, Eric, Eric Klein, Felix Kramer, Graham Banks, Jad Rita, Just Associate Wedge, Matt Walker, parentheses, Walkman 8080, close parentheses, Mike Etheridge, Nathan Phelps, Sanchik Kumar, Steve Lynn, Thomas Shea, and Tom Hilton. Thank you all so, so much. We are thankful for you. Very thankful for everybody here. Um, And I guess that'll do it for us this month, Brad, or this week, rather. It's true. Uh, we will be back next week with another edition of the tech pod. I'm going to be away. So we'll figure out when we're going to record that in the interim, but yes, uh, hope everybody has a lovely, lovely week and we will see you next time. Stay techie. I don't know. I got nothing there. It's like, I need a, we need a catchphrase. Brad's just nodding, not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs>